Okay, everyone, uh, it's two o'clock, time to begin. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, join you here at Mises University. I've been coming for a long time and it keeps getting better and better every year. Uh, one thing that I noticed uh, this time is there seems to be a little bit more teasing of faculty members by other faculty members <laughs> than in a typical year, you know, uh, accusing people of getting page numbers wrong, uh, sharing private photos of people in their backyards. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to do anything like that because I don't believe in that kind of one-upsmanship and because I'm better than them, frankly. <laughs> I was going to say not everything's a competition, which would allow me to transition into the title of my talk today, which is on competition and monopoly. Um, you know, this is a core topic for, uh, for Austrian economists because we have a particular way of thinking about competition. And, and the absence of competition in the form of monopoly that is a little bit different from the way some other economists approach the problem. And you know, this is a, a perennial, perennially important you know, sort of public policy topic. Um, you know, vice, the, the vice presidential, uh, Republican vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance, um, you know, is on record as taking a, a strong, you know, what he describes as sort of an anti-monopoly Position. He believes that the U.S. economy is too heavily concentrated, and it's important to break up. You know, he wants to break up big tech firms. He said that um, you know his favorite Biden uh, uh, administration official is Lena Khan, who's the head of the FTC and is certainly one of the most activist FTC chairs, Federal Trade Commission chairs, uh, in recent history. We'll talk about her a little bit later. Um, uh, but you know, this is. Um, part of a sort of long-running discussion about uh, whether global, the global economy and the U.S. economy in particular, you know, is, is sufficiently competitive, is, is, it, is it becoming less competitive, uh, 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 are, you know, is there an increasing tendency towards monopolization? A lot of this is in the context, of course, of tech companies because, um, you know, tech markets frequently, you know, have, have, have very large, you know, the, some markets are dominated by one large player, you know, search, 90-some percent of the search market uh, takes place on Google search, at least for now, right? That can change very rapidly. But, you know, in other industries, streaming music, media, and so forth, you have a handful of large firms, and many people think this is a sign of weakening or in, an inadequate level of competition. You know, there are groups like, you can't really read it, but the the in my mind, misnamed Open Market Institute, which is a strong anti-tech monopoly kind of a, kind of a group. And it turns out the evidence is a little bit more nuanced and subtle than uh, these activist groups often portray it. Just um, this week, there was a new um, NBER working paper that summarizes some of the empirical evidence on concentration and argues that, in fact, in, most, in, in many industries in the U.S., uh, these industries are not becoming more concentrated or less competitive, as that term is usually used, but it's an ongoing sort of uh, uh, you know, debate and discussion. Uh, just earlier this year, the Biden administration proposed a nationwide ban on non-compete agreements. Right, that's where you know you, you as part of an employment contract you agree that if you quit or are fired you will not work for a competitor of your previous employer you know for some specified period of time. These are quite common in some industries you know where where there's a, a desire to protect you know trade secrets and intellectual property and so forth. Um, but but critics believe that non competes are being used everywhere you know including entry level jobs. And that they are an abuse of, of, of sort of market power on the part of employers, so-called monopsony power, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. Um, so far, the status of this ban is sort of uh, it's, it's not it's not clear that the FTC has the has the um, legal authority to ban a particular type of employment contract nationwide. They claim that they do on the basis of antitrust law. And one one judge ruled against the Biden administration. Another judge this week ruled in favor of the Biden administration, so we'll see. But you know, this is, you know, th this, this non-compete ban, it comes in the context of a broader conversation about you know, how we think about competition, right? To some of these activists, you know, an agreement that you will not compete with another firm, uh, it, by definition, is anti-competitive, right? That reduces competition. So the government needs to prohibit 
any voluntary agreements not to engage in certain kinds of competitive actions. Is that the right way to think about it? Well, let's see. Um, you know, we all understand what the word competition means, what it means to compete, you know, in everyday language. I don't know, those, those of you who follow, if you like the Olympics or you follow basketball, you might have heard that a couple of weeks ago, the U.S. basketball team, which is favored to win the gold medal, the U.S. has been, you know, is one of the dominant uh, uh, countries in men's basketball, and there was a, a pre-Olympics sort of tune-up game between the U.S. and South Sudan, and I think the U.S. team was favored by like 50 points, and it ended up being a one-point game. The U.S. almost lost to South Sudan. LeBron James hit a layup at the last second, and I think that Sudan then missed a shot, uh, it, you know, a second afterward that would have won the game. So everyone was talking about, wow, we expected this to be a blowout. We thought the U.S. team would dominate South Sudan, but in fact, it was really competitive. That was much more competitive than we expected. Right? We, all, we all know what that means, right? Competing means, you know, there's some kind of a contest or some situation where, you know, participants are trying to do better than other participants. You're trying to win the race, you know, run faster than everybody else. Uh, you're trying to beat your competitors, you know, at school or if you're, you know, doing the exam here at Mises U, you're competing against the other students doing the exam. You want to win. You want to get first place, okay? But, but I guess my point is, you know, the way we think about competing, you know, rivalry, it's like a process of competition. It's not an end result, right? So, you know, if, if everybody, if every person who runs in the race gets an award, right, if everyone gets a participation trophy, that's not a competition, right? I don't know what that is. It's some egalitarian weird thing, okay? I guess you're not supposed to say, you're not supposed to say weird anymore. That's only for J.D. Vance, but... Um, uh, it, 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 but, but we don't normally say if everybody wins a prize, it was more competitive than if only one participant wins a prize, right? Yet the way mainstream economists use the term competition, right? A market is competitive if it has a large number of firms that all have exactly the same performance result, okay? If some firms do better than other firms, then the market by definition is not competitive in the neoclassical economics sense. Okay, um, Austrians, of course, use the concepts of competition and monopoly in something more like the common sense meaning of those terms. Okay, so a market is competitive when entrepreneurs uh, are free to engage in competing with other entrepreneurs, you know, for the uh, transactions on the part of consumers. Okay, and notice we can talk about, you know, to compete is to attempt to engage in market exchange, right? Buyers can compete against other buyers. There's only one unit of the good for sale. We each offer how much we're willing to pay, and the, whoever's willing to pay the most gets it, right? That's a competition among buyers. You could have a competition among sellers for uh, the purchases of consumers. So to compete is to engage in that process. A competition is one in which that process is taking place. And a more competitive situation is one in which the rivals are really you know, being very aggressive in you know, uh, adjusting their price or some other conditions to try to get in the sale. OK? Um, competition in the Austrian approach is also sort of a means of arriving at equilibrium prices. We've talked about prices already this week, but you know, competition among buyers, among sellers, is the process that leads to the establishment of a price in the market, a price that clears the market, that equates the quantity supplied and quantity demanded. Um, you know, we can talk about other sort of beneficial side effects of consumers, or, or, or producers competing against each other. Hayek has a famous essay published in 1968 with the title Competition as a Discovery Process. And what, what Hayek means is, you know, as part of trying to outcompete rivals to get the sale, to get the transaction, to get the business, uh, firms and other market participants uh, engage in a process of sort of experimentation and learning or discovery, if you like, of new technologies or new, new kinds of products, new uh, you know, latent market demands and so forth. So there are a lot of, a lot of you know, side benefits from engaging in the process of competition. Okay, so what about monopoly in contrast? What about a situation of monopoly that's different from uh, a competitive one? 
So, you know, in mainstream economics, monopoly is defined, I mean, you think I'm kidding, but I'm really not, as, you know, a, a, a market is monopolized if you have the presence of one or more firms with more than X percent of the market. And you say, gosh, professor, well, what is X? X is whatever you want it to be, okay? <laughs> Um, okay, you might say, look, okay, Google doesn't have 100% of the search market. You know, there's, there's Bing. I don't know, have you ever Binged something? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, I mean, all the, you know, OpenAI is coming out with a, a search tool, and so maybe, you know, ChatGPT search will end up being the dominant one. Who knows? But nowadays, we mostly Google things. That's why the, the, the particular brand name became the verb, you know, like Kleenex or Xerox or something. It's not 100%. Let's say it's 90%. Okay, well, that sounds like... Yeah, it doesn't seem super competitive. It seems like there's one big bully, you know, sort of pushing everybody else around. Okay, but what about 80%? What if Google had, you know, 70%? What about Spotify, you know, which has 50, 60% of the streaming music market? It's not 90%, but it's not 1% either. Is that, is Spotify a monopoly? Well, the, the way they answer this question is to say, OK, we're not going to divide things into discrete categories, monopoly or, or no monopoly. We'll say firms have monopoly power if they have even just a little bit of monopoly. And that makes monopoly more on a continuum. right? So anything that's not competitive as they define competition in, includes some element of monopoly. And really what they mean by this, in a technical sense, a firm has monopoly power if it has some ability to charge a price higher than its marginal cost. We'll get into a moment why that is, right? A result of this is if firms are earning positive economic profits, then they must be monopolies by definition. OK, we learned in, in uh, uh, Professor McCaffrey's entrepreneurship lecture, right, that in a world of uncertainty, entrepreneurs, earns prof earns profit, entrepreneurs earn profits or losses depending on the skill with which they can anticipate future market conditions, their ability to bear uncertainty successfully. OK, but in the neoclassical model, uncertainty is assumed away. There's perfect knowledge, right? So um, unless a firm has some kind of monopoly power, it's, it's competing against other firms that are just the same and just as capable, just as talented. Their entrepreneurs are just as skilled, capable, talented. So all firms should make exactly the same amount of profit. The only way a firm can do better than other firms is if it has some monopoly power. Now, this is very different, again, from the common sense notion of monopoly, right? You know, in the common law, monopoly was always understood as a grant of a special privilege by the state, by the king, okay? So, you know, like the, you know, the Dutch East India Company had the exclusive legal right to engage in trade between, you know, Holland and uh, Indonesia and uh, you know, the so-called far, far East or East Indies, meaning that you know, if another merchant ship wanted to sail to you know, Indonesia and pick up cinnamon or whatever and bring it back and sell it in Europe, they could be, that ship could be fired upon and sunk. Well, you, know, you could be killed because the king has decreed that only this company is allowed to engage in that kind of long distance trade. OK, or um, if you have a patent on something, right? If I have a patent on a good or service or technology, no other producer is legally permitted to sell that product or a closely related product, OK? So th that's the way, sort of, that's sort of the classical understanding of monopoly. Likewise, you know, what they call an oligopoly is a situation where you have, say, a small set of firms that collectively have a lot of market power you know, four or five firms that collectively dominate the market. Neither one is a monopolist per se, but they all have some degree of monopoly power. Collectively, they can engage in oligopoly behavior or oligopoly pricing. So a cartel would be a group of firms that has a legal, exclusive legal right to enter some market or to sell some product. Okay, so how many of you have seen a diagram like this in one of your college classes or high school classes, right? This, this, you know, this mostly comes from Alfred Marshall, but you, you get these models in the textbooks of what they call a perfectly competitive market. It's characterized, the, the idea is you have a market with lots and lots of firms, technically an infinite number of firms, each of which has a very small share of the market, technically a zero share of the market. It's really, a, it's a mathematical limit 
It's a set of limit theorems. As the number of firms approaches infinity, the size of each firm approaches zero. So imagine a market with an infinite number of firms that sell zero output. That's what your mainstream professors tell you is the ideal of a competitive market. Uh, because there's so many firms that are selling identical products, uh, you know, each firm faces a perfectly elastic or horizontal demand curve. You can sell as much as you want at the going price without driving the price down. You can withhold your output from the market. It doesn't drive the price up because you're so small relative to the market. Um, uh, that horizontal demand curve also gives you the marginal revenue for each unit sold. It's just the market price. And so the firm will choose to produce a quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. The price will be this you know, competitive price where the horizontal demand curve lies. Um, and you know, firms might be earning positive or negative profits in the short run when they're maximizing their profit by producing where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, but then Part of the uh, another assumption here is that you know if, if firms are earning positive economic profits, other firms can enter at zero cost, and you know sort of compete those profits away. So in the long run, all firms just exactly break even, no profits, no losses. Again, this is not a, a model of an actual market. It's sort of a thought exercise with deliberately and wildly unrealistic assumptions. So you might think, what what the heck is this good for? Well, it's used mainly as an analytical foil. To, to be compared to actual markets, right, in which you know, firms have a downward sloping demand curve for their product. And therefore, if you do the math, the marginal revenue per unit, per unit sold is less than the price that would be charged for selling that number of units, right? The marginal revenue curve is below the demand curve. The firm chooses to maximize profits by setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. But that quantity, QM, the monopoly quantity, when the, when, the, when the firm then uh, sets its price, because these monopoly firms have price setting power, market power, uh, they don't price at marginal revenue, right? They price way up on the demand curve as high as they can go, that price PM, the monopoly price. So the monopoly price is a higher price than what would have obtained under perfect competition. The quantity sold is less than what would have been sold under perfect competition. There's a loss of consumer well-being, so-called consumer surplus, some, some but not all of which is captured by the firm in terms of profit or producer surplus. But there's this horrible yellow triangle. This is not the same thing as a Hayekian triangle. right? There's this uh, uh, triangle that it represents so-called deadweight loss. Actually, the guy who invented this diagram uh, 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 or who popularized this, attempted to measure these deadweight loss triangles. Uh, Arnold Harberger um, just turned 100, I think today or, or yesterday, this week. Chicago economist, who is now 100 years old. Usually, we think Austrian economists live the longest, but here's one example of Chicago guy who seems to be doing pretty well. OK. What's wrong with this? So. You know, one problem, one emphasized by Rothbard, is that the notion of a perfectly elastic horizontal demand curve for a firm's product doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, in the actual you know, world of human action, we don't have you know, perfect mathematical continuity and smoothness represented by those curves, right? You have discrete units. And every supplier, no matter how small, every firm contributes some specific discrete quantity to, the, to, to, to uh, uh, the, the market quantity. So if the demand curve for the product as a whole is downward sloping, the demand curve fa facing each additional firm has got to be downward sloping as well. Each firm contributes at least something to the uh, output. So market prices would have to fall at least a little bit if a, a firm, enter, uh, no matter how small, increases its output. Um, you know, the other point, too, is that you know, if we believed in this sort of you know, neoclassical monopoly model, right, in which we say the monopolist is you know, withholding output from the market and reducing overall well-being by producing a lower quantity and a higher price than what would have obtained in a competitive market, um, if the policy response is to you know, force the price to be lower than what the firm wants to charge, and require the firm to increase its output to a level beyond that that the firm would, would prefer to produce, well, then we're sort of you know, violating the property rights of the owners, 
right? I mean, why should a firm be required to produce a certain quantity beyond the quantity that it wants to produce? Uh, you know, famous example is, you know, with movie stars, like there's Brad Pitt, right? You know, Brad Pitt makes a certain number of movies per year. I don't know, say he makes four, you know, movies per year. But, but he, he's not working every single day, right? I mean, he has a few days off, at least according to the tabloids, you know, he's doing whatever movie stars do in their day, uh, you know, in their time off. Well, he could be working. He could be making five movies, six movies, 10 movies, 20 movies. He could be making a movie every waking hour of the day. And, you know, there's only one Brad Pitt, okay? I mean, there are other actors with movie star good looks, but, you know, depending on your preferences, you might not regard them as a perfect substitute for Brad Pitt. But, I mean, so, so would, it, would it increase overall societal well-being if we required him at gunpoint to make as many movies as he can possibly make rather than allow him to choose to take a few days off which might actually increase the amount he gets paid per movie, right? He's creating a little artificial scarcity by, by, by not working every single day. Um, well, no, nobody thinks that, would, that that would be an appropriate way to increase societal well-being. But if we say, oh, you know, Google is a monopoly and it's abusing its uh, monopolistic uh, position to, to produce less goods and services than the, than the amount that consumers would want, therefore, we need to use the government to force Google to produce more, well, I mean, that's really not any different from the Brad Pitt example, okay? Uh, the the um, Austrian economist W.H. Hutt has made a similar point, Rothbard makes this too, that, um, you know, the standard argument on the deadweight loss is that, you know, when the monopolist is producing fewer units than the amount that would be produced on a perfectly competitive market, you know, that means that some resources are just sort of sitting idle, the machines are not being run. Uh, 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 you know, the factory is not running 24-7. Brad Pitt is not working all the time. Uh, so some of the time, resources are just sitting idle. And that's inefficient somehow from society's point of view. But Hutt pointed out that as long as all resources are privately owned, okay, then um, resources that are not currently being put into production are not idle. They're not being wasted. You know, they're being held in reserve for an appropriate time when they can be brought into production. That's a choice by the entrepreneur. That's a choice by the resource owner. It may be a strategic choice, right? I mean, think about, you know, with agriculture, right? You know, the three, three crop, three field crop rotation system or whatever, where, you know, you leave some land fallow so that it can regenerate its nutrients. The fact that every piece of land is not currently being used to grow crops does not mean that there's an inefficiency where land is just sitting idle. No, it's, it's idle for a reason. Or, you know, a vacant lot here in Auburn doesn't have a building on it. Okay, well, maybe the owner has gotten some offers for a building, but the owner believes that those offers, that, that the owner can get even a better offer, right? That, 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 that the offers received so far reflect potential uses of that land that are not the most valuable potential uses of that resource. So the owner is holding off for a better offer. Well, that's not an idle resource either. That is a resource in use. The use is it's sitting there waiting for an appropriate time to be put into production, okay? I will say, I think this is probably the only time that uh, Murray Rothbard, Brad Pitt, and W.H. Hutt have appeared on the same PowerPoint slide. You know, th <laughs> three, uh, uh, three important figures who are kind of equal in the looks department, I guess. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, and final point is that, um, uh, you know, the, the claim that... Uh, having a demand curve that's less than perfectly elastic, you know, somehow violates consumer sovereignty or something like that. I mean, remember, elasticity of demand, right? That, that's just a way of, 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 of capturing the extent to which people are willing to alter their consumption choices based on the price, right? Which itself reflects subjective preference on the part of buyers. Right? Elasticity of demand is not given by nature. It's not you know, forced on the market by a monopoly su supplier. Right? It's the result of voluntary human action. And so no, no elasticity you know, uh, measure is better or worse than some other elasticity measure. It's not better that demand be elastic relative to inelastic. It just reflects consumer preferences. OK. So what have Austrians said? Is there an Austrian explanation for monopoly? Well, there is, and uh, or there are several interpretations of monopoly, way, attempts to explain monopoly among Austrian economists, and they differ, they differ slightly. 
Mises did have a view, Mises had a view that on the free market, it is possible, though not especially common, for, uh, for, for monopoly prices to emerge. Monopoly prices that may not be all that significant in terms of you know, welfare or well-being, but are still analytically distinct from competitive prices. And what Mises has in mind is a very special set of circumstances where you have a single seller or a seller's cartel of a good or service you know, th that requires some kind of a unique, or, or they have the, the, the exclusive ability to produce this good or service because they have control over a unique input. Okay, not because they've been granted a privilege by the state, but you know, uh, example might be uh, Alcoa, which at one point in the 20th century had you know, over 90% of the market share in aluminum. And the reason is because one of the important ingredients in aluminum is a mineral called bauxite. And Alcoa, through vertical integration, had uh, ownership of almost all of the bauxite, had, had a huge share of the world's bauxite production. And so other companies wanting to make aluminum had a hard time entering the market because they couldn't get the bauxite because it was all owned by Alcoa that was using it to make Alcoa's own aluminum. Okay, So Mises says there are two conditions that must obtain uh, for a monopoly price to emerge. Again, single seller or seller's cartel and a, a, an inelastic demand curve above the price that would have obtained in the absence of the single seller or the seller's cartel. And in this case, Mises argues, the seller can reduce output, right, sort of traveling up that demand curve uh, and charging a higher price. And if you know how elasticity works, right, if demand is inelastic, then the firm can increase its revenues by selling fewer units because uh, the price you get per unit, the increase in the amount per unit more than compensates for the loss of the number of units, selling fewer units, okay? Because they're also producing less, presumably their costs go down. So the firm can increase profits by producing a lower amount than would be produced in the absence of these special conditions. And Mises says, yeah, I mean, technically this is a violation of consumer sovereignty because the consumers would have preferred, they would have been willing to pay enough, they would have preferred more output at a lower price and that would have, they could have compensated the monopolist for the loss in revenues. But Mises says this is very unlikely to obtain in the real world, just a handful of cases. It's not especially significant analytically, certainly would not justify you know, antitrust law or you know, the Federal Trade Commission or whatever. Um, it's just sort of a theoretical, uh, piece of minor theoretical interest. Uh, Rothbard essentially accepted the analytical framework of Mises' approach to monopoly price, but, but, but challenged it in other ways or refined it by pointing out, Rothbard pointed out, well, I mean, as we said before, all sellers face a downward sloping demand curve for their product. So is it really even possible, according to Mises' logic in Mises' framework, to distinguish this special set of circumstances that Mises described you know, from any other set of circumstances in which firms are producing products and selling them. Remember, Mises' theory is uh, these, uh, under these unique conditions, uh, if you have these unique conditions, which include inelastic demand above what otherwise would have been the competitive price, you get the emergence of monopoly prices. And Rothbard says, but there's no such thing as the competitive price. There is only the price that emerges on the market. We cannot look at any specific price and, and distinguish a monopoly price from a competitive price. There are just market prices, okay? In fact, Rothbard says there's no analytical, no way to identify a monopoly price other than legal restrictions, other than a government grant, you know, special government privilege, right? All firms try to maximize their profit, their net income, given what they expect demand to be in the future, right? Of course, there's uncertainty, so entrepreneurs will earn profits or losses based on how successfully they can anticipate those future prices. And all firms will price in the elastic range of their demand curve, not the inelastic range. And as we just pointed out, um, elasticity is the result of voluntary consumer preference anyway. So it really doesn't make sense to try to distinguish even analytically a monopoly price from a competitive price absent government intervention in the market. 
right? And you know, as with the Brad Pitt example, right? Um, the produ producer's well-being matters too, and you know, Rothbard, while accepting the notion of consumer sovereignty, or, or while appreciating the notion of consumer sovereignty developed by Mises and also by W. H. Hutt, Rothbard said, "Well, you know, we also need to take into account the well-being of the producers. So let's instead of." you know, trying to maximize consumer sovereignty, instead of looking for a system that privileges consumer sovereignty, let's just look at a system that maximizes or privileges individual sovereignty, where everyone's ability to make voluntary choices, whether as a consumer, uh, a worker, you know, an input supplier, a capitalist, an entrepreneur, everyone's well-being is taken into account, not just that of the consumers. In other words, according to Rothbard, the only meaningful operational concept of monopoly is government protection or government privilege. Well, as I'm sure you all know, this is not the view of the mainstream, whether in economics or in law or in public policy. Um, you know, for um, uh, you know, what, 130, 140 years, we've had a set of uh, laws in the US other countries have similar laws, so-called competition laws or competition policy, aimed at curbing alleged excesses of monopoly, monopoly power. Um, Tom DiLorenzo has some, a couple of excellent papers on the history of antitrust legislation. You know, what was actually going on was there was a lot of technological improvement, and larger firms were actually losing market share to more efficient competitors. So they went to the state and asked for a set of rules that would effectively allow them to cartelize their own industries and, and restrict the ability of some new entrants to come into the market. But you know, as sort of a so sort of a higher level summary, right? The, the, the way that most mainstream thinkers approach antitrust and competition issues is, you know, according to the so-called structure conduct performance paradigm or perspective. Right? So this view says. Well, we look at a particular market, you know, the market for toothpaste or whatever, and we start by analyzing the structure of that market. And by the structure, we mean, you know, how many firms are in the market and what is the market share of those firms? You know, if, if, it, if it's the case, as it is in reality, I didn't look up the exact number, but, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble and Unilever, Unilever, two large consumer products conglomerates between them have a very large share of the toothpaste market. They each own a lot of toothpaste brands. So the antitrust expert looks at that market and says it's not very competitive. You have a few large firms. You certainly don't have the horizontal demand curve and the zero profits and all that good stuff. So clearly, there's something wrong with this market. Uh, and you know, in a market like that, where you have this uh, uh, mon monopoly market structure, the result is going to be conduct on the part of those firms that is harmful to consumers, you know, higher prices and lower quantities. Right? The, therefore, the performance of that market in terms of societal well-being will be reduced compared to a more competitive situation. So government policy should change the structure, i.e., break up the firms, right? uh, uh, you know, force Procter & Gamble or Unilever to split into many small firms or to sell off parts of their toothpaste operation. So we get a, large number of smaller a larger number of smaller firms in the toothpaste market, that will make it more competitive, that will change the structure, that will result in better conduct, lower prices, and higher performance for the consumer. Okay, so it's all based on the neoclassical analysis of competition and monopoly that we've just critiqued, okay? Um, now, even you know, within mainstream economics, there's, there, there, you know, there's been a lot of recognition that this perspective is oversimplified. It leaves a lot of things out. For example, um, uh, Oliver Williamson, who won the Nobel Prize in 2009 and was, happened to be my dissertation advisor, uh, wrote about um, what he called the inhospitality tradition or assumption in I trust, which is the view he critiqued, the view that you know, any deviation from perfect competition must reflect market power and must be harmful to consumers. Right, so a firm having a large market share, well, that's not in the perfectly competitive model. Therefore, there must be something wrong. We need to fix it. Or another deviation from perfect competition that Williamson studied in particular was vertical integration, right, where a firm owns its own you know, supplier or distributor, and like, like a, a company like Alcoa, make, you know, selling a, uh, 
mining the bauxite, making it into the raw materials, make, uh, transforming the raw materials into aluminum, finishing the aluminum, selling the aluminum, right? If one firm is involved in more than one of those stages of production, that is also allegedly a violation of the assumptions of perfect competition. Williamson said, yeah, but, but there are reasons why firms do things like vertical integration, right? In particular, in his argument, they, firms wanted to reduce the transaction costs, the cost of transacting across stages. It might be more efficient in some cases for me to make my own inputs rather than try to source my inputs on the open market because I, then I don't have to negotiate the price all the time. I have a certain supply locked in. Maybe I could do that by a long-term contract, which would also be a violation of perfect competition. Maybe I want to do it by owning the input, uh, uh, input stage myself. Williamson said, you got to look at all these things on a case-by-case -case basis. There may be an efficiency reason for firms to engage in some kind of behavior that is different from what we would expect in an undergrad textbook where they have a depiction of perfect competition. Uh, some Chicago economists have also criticized the structure conduct performance paradigm. This is Harold Demsetz, who famously argued that uh, structure is not exogenous, but structure is the result of some previous process. In other words, the reason that Google has 90% of the search market is because its search works better, or at least it worked better before it became super woke, right? Um, you know, that we shouldn't just start by looking at the market shares of firms and begin the analysis there, right? We should ask, well, why do some firms have a larger market share than others? It might be because consumers actually prefer their product to another. And forcing a situation where only a few consumers can buy the favored product and everybody else has to buy from some other firm, because we have to have, you know, 82,000 firms in the market, um, you know, well, that is making consumers worse off because they may... Most of them may prefer to patronize one particular seller, and that may be the cause of the large market share. Um, a, a, fame, a, 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 a law professor who wrote a very famous book on this from the sort of Chicago school point of view, Robert Bork, became famous um, in the 1980s because he was nominated to the U.S. Supreme Court, and then he was attacked in the uh, Senate hearings for a bunch of stuff that he didn't actually say, and uh, it was a rare case. Now it's pretty common, right, for... C congressional confirmation hearings to you know, viciously attack Supreme Court nominees and so forth. But at the time, it was relatively rare. And his name became a verb, like to bork somebody means like to attack them you know, unsuspectingly in some kind of a, some kind of a hearing like this. Um, you know, the, the view that dominates the Biden administration has been sometimes you know, uh, mockingly referred to as hipster antitrust. They call themselves neo-Brandeisians after Louis Brandeis, who was a early 20th century jurist who embraced this view. That ba it's basically a return to the old structure conduct performance view that you know, firm size is the most important thing we should care about. If firms are big, they should be broken up. And um, you know, even if these large firms seem to yield benefits to consumers, we should still break them up because they might be hurting their workers or something else. So this, that's Le Le Lena Khan, the one who J.D. Vance seems to like for some reason. I don't know if she's, a I don't know if she's a ch also a childless cat lady. I didn't look that up. <laughs> so before we wrap up, um, let me walk you through a few other sort of current policy issues related to competition and monopoly. Um, again, I, as I referred earlier, uh, the, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Biden administration has proposed a ban on non-competes. So, you know, on the surface, it sounds good. Like, I mean, a non-compete agreement sounds like it's like it's bad for competition. So eliminating those would be good for competition, right? You know, non-non-compete would be compete. Um, but really, what's what's underlying this is what you might call sort of a snapshot view of competition. In other words, imagine that you know all of us who are speaking here at the Mises Institute, you know, in order to get to speak here this week and 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 get a small honorarium. You know, suppose we had to sign a contract saying that we will not give a similar speech for any other free market organization. Not that there are any that are just as good, but suppose there were, right? Um, you know, well then, that seems unfair, right? Now, now the other organizations can't compete with Mises U because the Mises Institute has locked up all the talent. That sounds bad, right? But, but remember, I mean, presumably nobody compelled us to sign that non-compete agreement. 
I mean, I've seen some of your memes, so maybe, maybe uh, Patrick Newman with his, with his gun, or David Gordon, his, but aside from that, right? <laughs> Trying to wake him up. As, aside from that, um, assuming that we had the choice to sign that contract or not, there was still competition between the Mises Institute and other, non other educational organizations, right? They were competing for the signature on that contract. I mean, others could have asked us to sign a non-compete, and we decided not to. So if you only look at comp you know, the situation once the contract has been signed, it looks, oh my gosh, there's, they're not, there's no competition. Everybody's locked in. But of course, if you look at the whole process, there was competition to get that signature in the first place. That's true of any contract. There was this really weird article years ago at the American Economic Review called Contracts as a Barrier to Entry, which I mean is kind of strange. Because you know, if I, I don't know, if I'm a, uh, uh, you know, say the Mises Institute uh, has a, a, you know, a gardening service that comes and cuts the lawn and waters the plants and maintains the grounds, you know, landscaping. It, say they sign a contract that says, okay, for the next six months, you'll be our landscaper. You'll come this many days a week. We'll pay you this much. Okay, once that contract has been signed, now there's a monopoly. Right? The Mises Institute only has one landscaper, and a new, new landscaping firm can't get the business of the Mises Institute because somebody else already signed the contract. Well, if we define that as anti-competitive, then any contract is anti-competitive. Any agreement to have a relationship over a certain period of time then excludes people who didn't sign the contract to, to substitute for that relationship during that same period of time. But of course, it doesn't make sense to ban contracts, right? because everyone is free to compete to be a contracting party, okay? Um, the other thing here is, you know, if you, if you say that firms are not allowed to offer, to, to offer a contract with a non-compete, well, presumably, the firm, the firm benefits from its employees signing a non-compete agreement, right? Um, uh, because they would be free not to put that in the contract. If they are, and employees are willing to sign it, then there's some mutually beneficial gain from trade. So if you ban non-competes, well now the, the services, you know, the marginal revenue product of an employee without a non-compete is lower to me than that of an employee who's willing to sign a non-compete for me. So I would presumably offer a lower wage, or I would compensate on some other margin. I would make the, I'd have to make the job less desirable on some other margin. Otherwise, it's costing me more. I'm getting a less valuable service in exchange for the same payment, which I wouldn't do. Okay, so essentially you're just, this kind of legislation, it just rules out one particular type of contract. So why would you, you know, if that contract is not desirable by both parties, then they won't sign it, right? The fact that they do mean it must be better than the alternatives, and now you've eliminated that type of contract from the market. Now you can't experiment with non-competes or different kinds of non-competes because they've been ruled out, okay? What about minimum wages? You might not realize that the minimum wage, minimum wage disputes debates are highly tied up with this sort of theory too. What we've been talking about so far, monopoly is market power on the seller side, but there's also a theory of so-called monopsony, which is market power on the buyer side. So the idea is, you know, McDonald's, you know, there's one McDonald's in town, and you know, that's the only place that entry-level workers can work. So instead of paying wage equal to the marginal revenue product, right, the, 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 you know, McDonald's will just pay whatever it wants. It'll pay a much lower price for labor because it has market power on the buyer side. This is one of the arguments that is used today in favor of minimum wages. It's not the card Kruger style, you know, supply and demand doesn't work anymore. It's that, well, the, the conventional arguments about minimum wages causing unemployment, according to this argument, assume that the market is perfectly competitive. But what if the labor market is characterized by monopsony? Then the government forcing the price to be higher than it otherwise would be is just like you know, with Alcoa or Microsoft or Google, the government forcing the price to be lower than it otherwise would be. Okay. Um, there's some work on uh, so-called common ownership where um, you know, one investor or investment group owns multiple firms, you know, BlackRock or whatever, has a majority stake in, you know, 10 different companies that are in the same industry, allegedly, well, then BlackRock pressures them not to compete against each other. And so you have 
sort of a monopoly that's created by common ownership. The alleged, you know, so the supposed policy response is to ban common ownership. Like you can't own stock in two different firms that compete in the same product market. But of course, this also, you know, this would essentially say then you can't have diversified companies. Or, or, a, or the same company can't sell two toothpastes that compete against each other because that's a violation of, that makes the toothpaste market less competitive. Which again, firms are free to, to offer as many different toothpaste brands as they want. And if they're offering two different kinds of toothpastes that are low quality because they're not competing against each other, well then another entrepreneur can offer a better kind of toothpaste. Freedom to enter the market is what matters to Austrians, right? Not the result of how many firms end up being in the market. And finally, um, there's an argument about so-called killer acquisitions being a rationale for antitrust. A killer acquisition is where you hear about this in tech all the time, like uh, you know, some startup company is developing some kind of technology for, you know, for let, let's say that uh, OpenAI is developing a search technology that would compete with Google. So Google's response is to buy the startup company and then shut it down, you know, shut down the competing product to maintain its dominance in the original market. That again is held to be a, a violation of competition, something that I trust should pay attention to. But again, it's back to this sort of snapshot thing, right? The, the assumption is that the small firm with the new technology would have existed under any sort of institutional conditions. Right? But if you ban these kinds of acquisitions, I mean, some tech companies are founded with the goal of creating something that will be valuable to a potential buyer. If you outlaw potential buyers acquiring these technologies, maybe the technologies would never have been developed in the first place. So again, it's like perfect competition. It's assuming a world that looks exactly the way you want it if you just outlaw this behavior that you don't like. But of course, outlawing the behavior that you don't like may give you an outcome that's worse than the one that you have in your mind as the so-called more competitive situation. Thanks a lot.